Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. So, we have our first little detour on Project Poirot because we are not going to be talking about a Poirot book today. We are instead going to be talking about a book that I think is very important in terms of kind of our project of looking at sort of the evolution of morality or evolution of Agatha Christie's ideas about morality in the course of her career, and that is And Then They Were None by Agatha Christie. So this is maybe her best known book. This and Murder in the Orient Express, I would say, are her two best known books. And this is also the last book that she wrote in the 30s. I believe that this was 1939. So before we leave the 30s, uh, and just because it is such a popular book and fits in so well with sort of the paradigm that we're looking at these books through, I wanted us to just pause and consider this particular work. Now for those of you who have never seen a Project Poirot video before, a little disclaimer, I don't do spoilers. Um, I will take you up roundabouts to when we find a, a body, which I do not consider to be a spoiler because these are mysteries. Uh, spoiler is that we will get some resolution to this to who done it just because it is a mystery and we generally do. And I will be talking about characters in detail. So if you consider character details to be spoilery, you've been warned. But all that being said, I, I think you can watch this and read a, and read one of these books without too much of a problem. So with that in mind, let's get into a quick little synopsis. So and then there were none is a book that is a classic kind of um, isolated guest house type book. Um, and I particularly really like that trope where we have all of our characters gathered together in a remote destination that they cannot leave and somebody dies and we have to figure out, hey, is it one of us? Is it somebody who's like sneaking in and trying to kill us? Like what's going on? Um, and I think that this was really sort of like one of the popularizers of that trope because it is so well known. So we open this book with a bunch of people going to a small house on a small island called Indian Island off the coast of Devon. And there are eight guests in total and each of them is coming to this house for a slightly different reason. So we have, this book is told in sort of alternating close third person point of view. So you're sort of in the head of all of our different characters for, yeah, I think you really get a point of view for almost everybody in this book. So there's eight guests that are coming and each of them has received a letter or some sort of communication that tells them a slightly different story about why they're going to this house. So we're seeing them on the train in the opening chapters kind of like and finding out what they think they're going to this house for. So some of them have been hired. There's um, a couple who already is at the house on the island and they have been hired as a butler and a housekeeper slash cook for this unknown owner. And so they're there. There's a couple of the guests who also are employed in some fashion by this person, Mr. Owen, Mr. and Mrs. Owen. And some of these people are coming because they've received letters from friends of theirs saying like, hey, I'm staying at this house. You're welcome to come join me. I'd love to catch up. So we kind of see why each of them is going and we quickly realize that something is slightly off because all of them are getting slightly different stories and have slightly different kind of understandings of what's going on. But what is consistent is that all of their letters either are from or reference a Mr. and Mrs. Owens who own the house that is on Indian Island. And this house is pretty famous apparently. Um, it's a brand new house. Like it's starkly modern on this like little like sea-worn island off of Devon. So it's kind of a famous house. So we are watching in the opening chapters everybody sort of converging on the house. So some of the kind of like there's, like I said, there's 10 characters in, in total that are at the house, but some of the more kind of like prominent ones or important ones, there is Justice Wargrave, who is a retired judge, who is kind of known to be like a hanging judge, like he was very harsh in his condemnations. There is Vera Claiborne, who was a games mistress, or who is currently a games mistress, but used to be a governess. And she thinks that she's coming to the island to be a secretary to Mrs. Owen for like the summer while she's on holiday from school. There is a, I think he's a captain, Philip Lombard. He's sort of like, he kind of reminds me of that guy in Cards on the Table, the adventurer dude in that one. Um, he like just lives abroad and has lived like a life of intrigue. So he's one of the big characters. There's Dr. Armstrong who has like a very successful practice in Harley Street. There's Miss Brent, who's like a judgmental old jerk, basically. There's a General MacArthur, not 
that General MacArthur, but a General MacArthur, who uh, is retired, but was, I guess, like a big deal during the First World War. There's Mr. Bloor, who we quickly come to realize that he was hired as sort of like an investigator by the Owens for this party, and a number of other characters. There's like a young playboy. Anyway, so we have like just a bunch of different characters all kind of converging on this house, and they all quickly realize that they've been told different stories about what's going on. The people who thought that they were coming to meet their friends realize very quickly like hey my friend ain't here WTF basically so they all kind of are a little on edge it's it's sort of a weird house it's super modern but it just feels like kind of unsettling and so after dinner they kind of all they start kind of putting some of the pieces together that something's off after dinner they're all gathered like in the parlor or wherever having their like dinner drinks and smoking cigars and their smoking jackets I have no idea but they're all hanging out after their dinner and all of a sudden they hear a voice come over and start and that voice starts accusing Using each of them of a terrible crime basically um, I think it include yeah it says specifically who did what crime and it's just going through each of them including the butler and the housekeeper so all ten of them are accused of this terrible crime and they all sort of get blustery and start saying like oh, we're, we're gonna leave tomorrow there's um, the only way to get to the house by the way is this little boat that only goes back and forth once a day. So they're like, well, fuck this. I'm going to leave on that boat tomorrow. This is terrible. I have no idea what this this voice is talking about. So sort of in the middle of all of that, like, blustering, um, the young playboy, I think his name is Anthony something, he starts choking and quickly dies. He, and essentially he dies in a way that they can't tell if he choked, if it was poisoning, like what the deal was. And from there, the book continues. And I'm not going to be able to get into as detailed of a discussion about this because I don't want to get too spoilery. But suffice it to say, essentially what we spend a lot of this book doing is being in the heads of each of the characters and you know I'm not going to tell you if all of them committed the crime that they were accused of or not and I'm not going to tell you if all of the crimes that they were accused of were like didn't have like some context to them but basically this is essentially a psychological study of what guilt or what regret does to somebody's mind or what the lack of guilt and regret does to somebody's mind because we spend a lot of time in each of these characters like psyche listening to them kind of mull over the action that's been brought up in an accusation against them and either their justifications for it or their denial of it or their guilt over it or their regrets and we see what that is doing to their minds and then we also see this is a book that is very suspenseful I would say like there's a lot of like kind of ratcheting up of terror as the terror grows we see their minds become almost more like animalistic and just like reverting to sort of like almost like a fugue state where they're sort of like in this or like magical thinking I don't know like this repetitious thought process and it ends up by the end of the book it feels very claustrophobic and I think that this is maybe aside from from Crooked House, which is another one we're going to detour and talk about. I think this is maybe Agatha Christie's most kind of pointed discussion of what evil is and what evil does to people. So a couple of notes like of things that we've been observing throughout the project. So first of all, we have to address like the racism, like casual racism, not meant, it's not, I don't think like actively pernicious on her part, but just in the title alone, like the history of this title. So this book was originally titled 10 Little N-Words, not great. It's a reference to a nursery rhyme that is very prominent in this book. And side note, Agatha Christie loves like nursery rhymes and like children's songs as the basis of her plots. I don't know why she does that. But anyway, this is one of those. So originally, I think that's what it was an allusion to. Then it was retitled Ten Little Indians. And I'm not sure if that's a reference to Native Americans or Native like natives, or if that is a reference to like as in people from India. Either way, not great, especially because the reason that this is called Indian Island is because it allegedly looks like the profile of an Indian. And again, I'm not really sure what that means. Like when she describes it, you're like, I don't really understand what this means. Like, what am I supposed to be picturing here? I don't know. Eventually, somebody sort of like realized that both of these were problematic titles and we just got and then there were none, which I think is a much a big improvement. But I think that it's important to note that because it kind of gives you a little insight into just like the casual, like racial 
assumptions, stereotypes, whatever of the time that this was written. And we also see some of that like kind of xenophobia and casual racism definitely in this book from, uh, well, several people. Captain Lombard for sure and General MacArthur definitely come to mind as two of the biggest perpetrators of that in this book. I will say though, I was reading some kind of like critical things about Agatha Christie and I do think that they make a good point that by the late 30s, kind of like by the this point in Agatha Christie's career, a lot of that, especially like the xenophobia piece pieces are relegated to two different character types, one being servants and the other being military people. That those are who are usually portrayed as sort of being suspicious of foreigners or not racist, there's a lot of other racists in, in these books, but specifically suspicious of foreigners. That's kind of diminishing and going into specific character types in Agatha Christie's work by this period. But we definitely do see it in this book because we have a couple of military folks and a couple of servants. So we definitely do get that lovely flavor in this book. This book is a huge what you see isn't always the truth type story. And I don't think I can say any more about that without giving it away. But again, that is a huge just kind of I think underlying motif of the mystery genre, this idea that you can't trust your perceptions always that you have to, I mean, it kind of speaks to a sort of like common sense Scottish realism type philosophy, I just realized like most mysteries do, because what it really is encouraging the reader to do is not to trust others, but to kind of like, take upon one's own like agency of determining truth for yourself. So there's a sort of like like, I don't know, like nihilistic relativism in that, or maybe like, depending on how you look at it, um, my fellow philosophy nerds out there, I think that there can be a very fine line between nihilism or existentialism and common sense realism, depending on how you look at it. Um, so anyway, I think that that is definitely baked into this particular book for sure. If you know the solution to this, what you see isn't always the truth. Yeah, like, right. And then in terms of technology, I just wanted to mention that for or like technology, like design sort of where we are in the 20th century, we're in like the late 30s, um, I think 39. And I do think that there's an interesting juxtaposition between sort of in our minds, when we think of like an isolated house mystery, we tend to think of like an old British manor or like a reclusive village or something like that, something that's a little more old worldy. Whereas in this book, there's sort of this juxtaposition between the sort of like natural, like primal island that because there's a lot of discussion of like the sea beating on the rocks and like the craggy rocks. And there's a huge emphasis on sort of like the natural wildness of the the like landscape around them. But then they're in this uber modern house, but like very clean lines, all of that. So there's this kind of juxtaposition between like sort of this more what we would think of as a more typical setting for this type of book, which is sort of like the wild British moors or like a wild British island, whatever. And this like very ultra ultra modern type house. And then in that ultra modern house, when the recording is playing accusing each of them, it's on this very old like, you know, those old record players that have like the big horn on it. It's described as being like a very old fashioned type of record player. So I just think that there's a lot of kind of um, playing with our expectations, maybe I I'm not sure if those genres were as established at that point as they are now, but I definitely think that there's sort of like the tension of those settings creates more menace, at least it did for me. And um, I definitely think that you could kind of make some symbolic arguments about how we're having this intense examination of evil and we have like kind of two extremes of metaphoric evil. So you have sort of the like primal natural evil, like think, like when chimpanzees go on like a war path and like smash babies brains in. I'm sorry, that was graphic, but like, you know what I mean? Like that sort of like primal animal instinct of evil that is certainly a part of humanity. And I think something that Agatha Christie certainly does explore in her works that sort of like just visceral violence that we all have in contrast with this very like modern and clinical almost like sterile, that's the right word, like sterile environment that's very like cold and calculating and is evil in its calculation. I think that that kind of is also working to create menace because we're seeing both parts of the human experience of evil in this novel. We definitely have some like pre like uber premeditated murder happening in this book. But we also see as people are in the situation longer and longer, their kind of animal side coming out, where they're almost identifying more with the island. And I think you definitely see that more as the book goes on. 
So anyway, just in terms of like straight up themes um, and specifically talking about evil, I do think that the setting really adds to how Agatha Christie is talking about evil on a subconscious level. And I think that that is like a fascinating masterstroke of how she kind of set up the overall atmosphere of the book. And then I was talking in my wrap up last week about this idea of like petty tyranny or like domestic evil. And I definitely think that we see that even more in this book. I'm so glad that like reading chronologically, you can just see this so much clearer that there are two characters in particular and I don't I don't especially want to get into too much detail because I don't want to spoil this too much but there's one character in particular who's what they are accused of is the death of a child and so there's sort of and like the circumstances around that were very domestic so I think that that that's one end of the spectrum and the other is this character of Miss Brent and she is essentially accused of the death of a housemaid of hers and she kind of is like that's complete nonsense she she killed herself and essentially what the person is accusing her of is setting up the circumstances under which this maid would kill herself and it's very interesting because you very quickly see how much disdain Agatha Christie has for Miss Brent. Maybe more so than, like, she's viscerally dislikable. And this gets back to what I was talking about, that I think Agatha Christie has a kind of visceral revulsion to that type of person who is sort of a petty tyrant or is controlling in a domestic sphere um, in a way that's emotionally manipulative or abusive. And you can definitely feel that in this book again. This Miss Brent is very much a reminiscent of the mother in Appointment with Death not as like repulsive, but is definitely not great. <laughs> and I do think it also raises an interesting question because essentially what she really hates about Miss Brent, what you can tell the author really hates about Miss Brent is that she's a hypocrite. So she is extremely, extremely religious. She's always going on and on about God, but this maid got pregnant basically and she turned her out of the house. And so I think Agatha Christie is really like very specifically condemning her for not of, of like, okay, well, if you want her to keep this baby, if you want to do the Christian thing, that means that you should have stood by her and supported her by letting her keep her job, but instead you didn't. So that's also an interesting kind of dynamic at play, I think, and speaks to the fact that Agatha Christie, as I mentioned before, was deeply suspicious of religion. So... Yeah, there you go. But overall, I, I have so much more I want to say, but I feel like if I do, I'm going to get too spoilery. Overall, what I really just love about this book is I think that it is the most detailed exploration of what it means to have a guilty mind and what that does to you. It's the metaphor that is being extended in this book, I think is one of her more sophisticated. I think thematically, this is one of the more sophisticated books. And beyond that, it's a very suspensive, like propulsive read. I find this to be a book that once I start reading, I have a very hard time putting it down because it just, it, it really ratchets up the tension. The pace keeps increasing. There's a couple of nice twists and turns in terms of who is thinking what and who's aligned with who and all that kind of thing. And I, I just think that this is just a stellar book and probably probably her best exploration of evil. So if you've not read this and you're at all interested in sort of like the psychology of Agatha Christie, I think that this might be where I'd recommend you go. Anyway, I'm not sure. I feel like I've been rambling for a very long time. We'll see how I edit this together in a way that is not spoilery for you guys. But anyway, that was my thoughts on And Then There Were None. I just, I think that this is a great book. This would be a top five Agatha Christie book for me. I think it's just fantastic. Yeah. So I recommend this one. So before I go, I do have to tell you guys that I am going to be pushing pause for a few weeks on Project Poirot. I'm very sorry to do this. I'm very disappointed in myself that this is how things have ended up. But the reality is doing these videos takes some of the most time for me out of everything that I do for YouTube. And I am taking a certification exam and the first week of February, and I really need to focus on doing that. And I'm just not gonna have enough time to do the kind of research and close reading that I want to do for these videos. Basically, I never wanna produce something that I'm not proud of. And I feel like I would be doing that if I push myself to keep putting out a video a week in the project for the next few weeks. So with that in mind, I'm gonna push pause on Project Poirot until February. So I will have Sad Cypress up for you guys the first weekend of February. And again, I really apologize for those, like I know I have a couple of people out there who actually watch these every week. And I'm really sorry that I'm pushing pause. I'm disappointed that that's the case, but I hope you guys understand. I just 
just, I really got to focus and get this certification done because I really, I just need to get it taken care of. So anyway, I appreciate you guys understanding. Thank you so much to everybody who watches and comments and enjoys these videos. Like I said, they are, they're not easy to make. And so I really appreciate it when people enjoy them. That's, that's why I do this. So like I said, I will see you guys back for Project Poirot the first weekend in February, but I will be having my normal other two videos every week. Um, up through then. So look for those. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I needed to tell you guys. So I hope you've enjoyed this week of extra content. I've definitely enjoyed making it. I'm sorry things are so dark. The sun is going away and my light is dying. So anyway, I'm going to wrap things up here. I hope you guys are having a really wonderful week. I hope you had a really great start to your year and that that is just sign of good things to come. If you didn't have a good week, don't worry, you've got 51 more you can you can turn this around but anyway that'll do it for me if you enjoyed this video please do like subscribe follow me on the social meds if you're so inclined all that information is listed in the description box below and that will do it have a great day and i will talk to you guys on tuesday bye